What is an ectopic pregnancy? What you should know? How do we treat them? And what do you do afterwards? I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford, a board certified fertility doctor, and I am here to help you understand your body, health, fertility, your hormones. This channel exists so that you can become a better advocate for your own health. So please, please subscribe and share and ask questions so that I can know what information you want to learn about. Today, we're going to talk about an ectopic pregnancy, which is something very personal to me. I had many miscarriages before I had my children. My two kids are my pregnancies, five and six. So I had three miscarriages and then I had an ectopic pregnancy. And that one emotionally and physically was the absolute worst one. When you have an ectopic pregnancy, what it is, is a pregnancy that's outside the uterus. So we have to remember that fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube. And in the fallopian tube, what is happening is that egg has to get fertilized within the first 24 hours after it is ovulated. The embryo though divides and grows and develops. So it goes from a very early stage, from like a day one stage, one cell, into about 300 to 500 cells by the time it's an implantation stage embryo and entering the uterine cavity about five or six days later. So the egg is in the fallopian tube for the entire first part of its journey. So for five to six days. And I think many of us just think of the fallopian tube as a highway, a vessel to get the egg from point A to point B, but it's actually quite important. The internal environment of the tube is connected. The tube is open to the peritoneum or the abdominal cavity. So the tubal environment mimics our peritoneal environment, which is different than the intrauterine environment. There's actually little valves as the tubes are entering into the uterus. And so the uterine environment is different. This is why if you have things like endometriosis or inflammation, that tubal environment can make a difference or decrease your pregnancy rates. Well, if you have tubal damage, tiny, small scar tissue, or if the tubes just don't function normally, you might be at risk for an ectopic pregnancy. So in addition to being the place where fertilization happens and early embryo development happens, the fallopian tubes also have little cilia and little contractions that they help get the egg and sperm together and then get the egg moving towards the uterus. So they actually have a function as well. And remember, none of our tests have seen if you have tubal patency or open tubes, like an x-ray test, they don't tell us if the tubes function. We don't have a way to test that. So for an ectopic pregnancy, the pregnancy is moving slower or it encounters a barrier. And what happens is that that pregnancy starts to implant into the fallopian tube. Well, the pregnancy can't implant there all the way. There's a very thin layer of muscle and the pregnancy needs that nice thick muscle of the uterus to really get a good implantation. So what happens is that it will start to grow. It gets to its early stages and there might be enough blood flow to that tube to keep it going for a little bit, even if it's not growing and developing normally. So when you have an ectopic pregnancy, you might have a positive pregnancy test. It might be fainter than you would expect. It might not be getting darker or your HCG levels may not be rising appropriate because a normal developing pregnancy is going to grow and divide as it goes along time. And if it's halting that development, you might get a plateau or a slow rise. You also might get pain. So you might feel pain on one side. One-sided pain can be a warning sign. And so if you're like, oh, I have this left-sided pain that's pretty bad, the faint pregnancy test, that could be a warning sign as well. And I often see, and personally, one of the things that I had was some like dark spotting because that pregnancy is not implanting in the uterus, yet you're not having a huge drop in your progesterone. You're not getting a full menstrual bleed, but you're also not having a supportive uterine environment. And so it's unstable and you might get bleeding or spotting and it might be more dark and feel different than a period. And this is why if you're having bleeding in early pregnancy, we always want you to get an evaluation. So sometimes it might be, hey, it's too early or your levels are fine or we'll do an ultrasound. But if you're having faint positives, persistent bleeding or spotting and pain. These are all warning signs that you want to bring up to your doctor. We can usually diagnose an ectopic pregnancy sometimes by ultrasound. So you might see a bulging mass in the fallopian tube on ultrasound. You also may not. 
And that's because if it's not growing and dividing normally, you might not see the actual pregnancy. The tubes are hard to see on ultrasound. So there is something called a discriminatory zone of your HCG. And what this means is that if your HCG level is over 1500, we should see a pregnancy inside the uterus. And if we do not, you have an ectopic pregnancy by default. So if you're having a high HCG, the uterus is empty, then that can also diagnose an ectopic pregnancy. Importantly, there's also something called a pregnancy of unknown location. So low HCG, not over 1500, maybe it's plateaued or not rising appropriately, and you don't see anything in the uterus and you don't see anything in the fallopian tube. And those are approached a little bit differently. Now with an ectopic pregnancy, once we've diagnosed it, we've got to decide what to do next. It's always important to know the worst thing or the most concerning thing is that an ectopic pregnancy could become a surgical emergency. So if that happened, the tube, as it couldn't contain this placenta trying to grow in, could rupture and blood could come out, filling your abdominal cavity. You'd have severe pain. I always say when you have peritoneal pain, you know. So if blood is in the peritoneal cavity, it is a hunched over terrible pain. Some people have nausea, vomiting, some people pass out and you might start to feel weak or dizzy or lightheaded. So severe pain with a positive pregnancy test, go to the doctor, go to the hospital. Now that case, you are rushed to the surgery suite. We open you up or put a camera inside, often have to take out the damaged tube. If you are not in a surgical emergency and we diagnose an ectopic pregnancy, depending on its size, if there's cardiac activity, so how far along it is, and depending on if you're otherwise stable, how high your HCG is, there's two different treatment options. One is going to be surgery. So still surgery, this is a laparoscopic surgery where you put a camera in the abdomen and you go in and you either cut out the tube or you try to cut open the tube and take out the pregnancy. I typically see patients at a later stage, so more often my patients are just getting the tube removed because if we leave it in and it's been damaged, it has a risk to get blocked later or develop a hydrosalpinx, which is a dilated fallopian tube, and those have to come out. So to save ourselves from double surgery, very often my patients are deciding to just remove the tube. Sometimes you don't get a choice. The tube is too damaged or where the pregnancy is or to stop bleeding, the tube has to come out. But removing the tube is called a salpingectomy and just cutting open the tube, taking out the ectopic and trying to sew it back together or cauterizing it is called a salpingostomy. But those are the two different options that you can think about. Now, after surgery, you typically want to make sure that you've gotten all the little fragments of the ectopic pregnancy. So you still want to have your HCG go down to zero. And I always recommend, unless you're moving on to IVF, you would want to get an evaluation of the fallopian tubes to make sure they're still open. So that would be like an HSG or hysterosalpingogram, the x-ray dye test afterward. But you don't have to sit out typically any amount of time. Most people say once your HCG is back to normal, you're good to go. However, surgery is invasive. It's not necessarily a fun thing. You might lose a tube. Another advantage though, you might get a diagnosis. So if you have bad endometriosis in your abdominal cavity, we might learn about that. And you visually get to see the other tube to know if it is at risk as well. The other treatment option is the one that I had, which is called methotrexate. Methotrexate is a chemotherapeutic agent. So methotrexate is a folic acid antagonist, which means it stops the cell from uptaking folic acid. As that cell is uptaking folic acid, that's an important and crucial step in cell division. You know this because we always say you need to take folic acid when you're pregnant so that you don't have a birth defect. But if we stop the cells from being able to take up folic acid, stops their division, and hopefully stops the pregnancy from continuing to grow. Now, when you get methotrexate, there's a very specific algorithm that we have to follow, meaning you get the injection and then you have to check your HCG levels four days later and seven days later. And we're looking for a 15% drop from day four to seven. If you haven't had it, then you can get a second injection. Now, you might notice from when you were diagnosed to day four, you might have an increase in your HCG and that freaks everybody out. 
that's okay. The medication hasn't worked yet. And we're specifically looking for that drop from four to seven. Now, just because you get methotrexate doesn't mean that you're out of the blue and that the tube isn't going to rupture. So you still need to think about all those warning signs because I have had patients get methotrexate and then still have the tube rupture and need surgery, which is really, really stinky. Now, after methotrexate, as you're following it down, you might notice some side effects. So some of the side effects, because it does stop cell division, can include muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, headaches. You're not going to see the full chemotherapy side effects. So don't worry about hair loss and some of those profound things. These are very temporary because you're just getting a little one-time bolus of the medication, very different from if you have cancer. But after the fact, we still need to make sure that HCG gets down to zero, that all of the small placental cells are out of there. But then you have to wait three months to get pregnant. And the reason why is because we've got to let all of that medication out of your system so that you don't have a birth defect develop later. Those birth defects, things like neural tube defects, no brain, open spine, can be devastating. And because that is how the medication works, it's a three-month sitting out period. To be honest, this was good for me. It allowed me to have a mental break when I went through it. I hate methotrexate. It hurts. It's like terrible. But afterward, I was able to make big lifestyle changes, really decrease inflammation, and mentally it gave me a rest from the cycle of trying and losing pregnancies. Still recommend an x-ray test to check to see that the tube is all healed and everything's good if you're trying to get pregnant naturally or with IUI or ovulation induction, but some people might choose to go on to IVF after the ectopic just to decrease the chance of it happening again. Hope this helped answer some of your questions about ectopic pregnancies. Ask more below so we can get to them. And you can always get more information on the As a Woman podcast or on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thank you so much. Please like and share the video and subscribe to follow along. Thank you, friends.